Let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's host. I'm its creator. I'm also the chief cat herder for the next hour. I'm delighted to see so many of you here today. We have an important topic and a great guest. Uh, Matt Alex is one of my favorite people in the higher education space. He is a dynamo of energy, constantly racing around. I have no idea how he does all this, but he hosts conversations on Clubhouse. He's constantly bashing away at people on LinkedIn. He's thinking, networking, and above all, running a consultancy that tries to help colleges and universities redesign and rethink higher education. And that last point is something that we've been working on here in the forum for almost six years. So with no further ado, I would really look forward to bringing him on stage. Let's see how all this works. Here he comes. How you doing, Brian? Hello, Matt. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you, too. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. You're in Chicago? I am. I am. I think you can see a little bit of my skyline uh, out there. But yeah, I'm in. I'm just a little bit uh, in River West in Chicago for the folks that know Chicago. Oh, nice. Well, we should be uh, hearing some howling winds soon, I suspect. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Matt, you've you've been a participant in the forum for years, so you, you know how we like to introduce things. We, we'd like to ask people to tell us what they're going to be working on for the next year. So, so tell us, what are, what are the big ideas, the big topics, and the big projects that you're going to be looking at for the next year? Yeah, so, I, I, you know, one, I want, I want to say, you know, I'm very grateful for the work that you do and, and the people that you bring together. It's, it's something that's so needed. You know, uh, I've been in higher ed for about 30 years, 20 of them, you know, consulting some of the most uh, largest uh, schools, state, Ivy and, and community colleges. You know, we're just in a different time. And things that I did 20 years ago is not the work that I will do moving forward. It's not the work that I do today. Uh, and that's really helping campuses reimagine uh, their academic enterprise, their campus enterprise. Uh, getting them to think beyond just the transactional elements of what a campus does, you know, enrollment to back office transactions. I, in my new firm, and, and that's Beyond, and I don't really like to talk about it because I, I believe Beyond stands on its own. I believe uh, the work that I do is anybody can do. And so I really uh, foster that discussion. Mm. And the discussion's really around how do we enable the right transformation in, in, at, at universities that all of us can get behind. Right now, if you ask schools what their purpose is, you will get a different um, viewpoint from faculty, you will get a different viewpoint from students, you will get a different viewpoint from parents, a different viewpoint from uh, administrators, and you will get a different point from industry, right? But we have to serve all of them. And so the question that I always do and I always work with the leaders that are on campus is how do we serve you to help whoever you're trying to resolve the problem for? Uh, sure. So the next, you know, the past year, I've been really focused on, I would say, campus leaders that have asked me to say, hey, Matt, you know, coming out of the pandemic, how do we make this transformation? My discussions pre-pandemic was much different. We were very uh, tactical, enrollment based, you know, the discussion I have today is about how do we reimagine how we serve our students? How do we serve our faculty? How do we serve our industry? And the work that I'm doing now and I will be doing uh, in the upcoming years and beyond is helping leaders become leaders that will form uh, campuses that serve all type of students. Uh, right now, we don't always serve all type of students. And so I work with some of the largest community colleges today Mm. We imagine what they do. I work with some of the uh, mega schools. I work with some of the smaller schools that are in the crosshairs of um, of the pandemic still, you know, and um, I would tell you my my work is is going to be evolving because everyone's work on campus is evolving uh, the way we will serve and the way we teach and the way we, uh, um, you know, produce things is going to be different. I, and I like the way you kind of said, I, I kind of bash people on LinkedIn. Um, I always make the statement that I'm just making people feel a little bit uncomfortable. And a lot of times people just say things just to say it. And a lot of times people just 
are very comfortable with what they know, I sometimes want you to think about what you don't know. How do you unlearn what you know? Yeah. Uh, that's when I get the conversations going. And, you know, I have conversations on campus with, with different type of constituents. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I welcome that because sometimes I may not be right, but let's have that conversation as we move forward. So, Very good. That sounds like a very, very busy year with quite a lot uh, at stake. Friends, uh, I have some questions, but this forum is for you. Uh, this forum is for your questions for Matt. Uh, and again, you can do so, you can pose those questions by either hitting the raised hand button to quickly join us on stage, or you can t hit the uh, question mark button to throw in a question or a comment. Uh, and uh, just to help get things rolling, I I'd like to start with one question of my own and then hopefully get out of the way, Matt, which is people have been talking about the idea of a snapback uh, once the pandemic infection rate drops below pandemic, that there's a, a big drive to try to recapture where we were, say, fall 2019. But how can we not do that? How can we advance and try to retain and build on our successes, the things that we've done well that have actually been a step forward? Yeah, and, and I, I'm all with it for us not snapping back, because I, I'll be honest, as a as a partner at Deloitte, I was I was frustrated working at schools that didn't want to transform. Um, I really felt that we needed to um, get people to recognize what the future holds. And this goes back to um, who are we serving? You know, what does the student of the future need? Uh, how do we work with them to meet their goals and aspirations? You know, uh, President LeBlanc always makes the statement, you know, time is the enemy of the poor. And yeah. yet we, as a um, higher ed ecosystem, we're, we are on an earn it model. And as long as we focus everything on earning something, earning 120 hours, earning uh, your grade, earning a GPA, earning, we become in this model of like earning something. Mm -hmm. Coming out of the pandemic, we have to start to look at how do we build campuses that focus on learning, the learn it model. You know, how do we teach them competency? How do we form the right majors that allow them to go into market? How do we work with high schools to come in and, and help them um, formulate dual enrollment so that when they come, they're not unprepared? I will tell you the conversations I have with faculty is students are not prepared when they come onto campus. Well, we can't fix that unless we work together with the high schools. So when we think about a pre-pandemic higher ed, we were isolated. We were isolated as we are the institution and everyone has to follow our rules. We, are, we serve a certain way. We, we were driving towards a certain set of metrics. And I think we gotta say, who are we serving? What type of students are coming in? How do we build on that? And then we learned so much during the pandemic in terms of the technology We've now, we've now all can agree that you can actually have a lot of communication virtually. Like just this dialogue is as good as a lecture in a lot of cases, right? So why can't we have this dialogue with as many people as we want? You know, we have 130 people here. Why can't we have that in a classroom setting at virtually? But then when we are on campus, how do we become interactive? How do we start having that critical critical reasoning, critical thinking. If we start thinking about the future of engagement as opposed to the past of engagement, I think we will drive a institutions that aren't going to snap back. Now, the schools that are in the crosshairs. They better not snap back because they're going to go out of business because the, because the mega schools and the schools that are reaching, you know, 130,000 students are going yeah. to take their students away. And if it's about enrollment, there, it's a losing game. But if it's about the brand and the value that you're going to bring them, how do you specialize certain things for them? How do you give them the uh, convenience and the affordability that many people are looking for? That's when uh, the schools and the crosshairs have to look at it. Now, the IVs and the state schools and the ones that are research one, you know what? They don't have to make a lot of changes. And that's OK because they serve a certain set of students. But I think there is a set of students that we don't service that a lot of these schools can serve. 
And I think that's what we should be really be focusing on. And I think then you won't snap back because if you do snap back, you're going to put yourself in the crosshairs. That's a that's a great answer. Uh, in the chat, there's been an exchange from uh, several people, including Mathieu Plourd and uh, Regina Uribe, who have mentioned that uh, we need to be serving students who uh, we're failing to serve, uh, which is which is terrific. Uh, friends, there's a um, th that's my question, and you can see Matt is a furious thinker with a lot of great stuff. Uh, let me bring on uh, one of our uh, questioners uh, up on stage, our old friend uh, Tom Hames, coming to us from Texas. And he'll continue, I think, a blue theme, a uh, blue visual theme as we as we go. <laughs> me, and Tom, me and Tom might have called each other, you know, said, hey. I'm, 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 I'm stuck in the blue room, have been for the last two years. So. <laughs> um, yeah, it kind of, kind of messes with your sense of perspective. Um, so uh, my question is this, is that, you know, you mentioned earlier a bunch of different stakeholders in the educational process and that different stakeholders have different goals that want to be pleased and so on and so forth. Um, I, I kind of, I, I understand where you're coming from, but how do we get those all to be aligned instead of having to, you know, play one tune for one group and one tune for another? I mean, we have, I think the one thing the last year has taught us is the importance of focusing on individualized learning those students who I have, I teach at a community college with a lot of at-risk students, cool. and, and the thing that I have really bore down on, borne down on in the last couple last couple of years since we've gone remote, is that individualized instruction to really uh, keep those students engaged and keep them, you know, in the process. Um, and it feel it seems to me that that should be everybody's goal. Uh, and I don't know. Uh, I feel like we get distracted by a bunch of other things. How do we work toward uh, some sort of alignment on that to be more student centered? Yeah. So the, the way that I do all of my uh, work with my clients, I start with a design thinking model. And if for the folks that aren't familiar with design thinking, it is around who are your personas in your campus. So, of course, we have students, but you may have a first time uh, first time in college student. You may have an international mm -hmm. student. You may have a, a student that is, has a single parent home. We may have a socially disadvantaged. Each of their needs are somewhat different in the way mm -hmm. that we uh, support them. So, of course, when we design the whole campus, we know what all of them need, and we design very systematically to what everyone needs. But then there is these elements of every campus that we have to figure out how do we personalize it for that first time in college student who needs more guidance during that process? How do we work with the low income um, areas where the high schools are not preparing their students well? How do we put programs in there and your community college could easily step into a high school ecosystem and bring them along earlier in that process where you there's some funding and other things that you're doing, but some of the colleges I do are doing dual enrollment at that point. Um, when we think about a design thinking model, we, not, we need to understand what their aspirations are because my, my daughter goes to a big name state, I mean, a big uh, private university. Her needs are very different than the community college uh, kids that my, the, my clients are serving, right? And so how do we serve them? So we have to identify who they are. Some students don't need that help. They, they like to be on their own. They want to be driven on their own. But there's some students who don't even know that they need help. So part of the design thinking element is what are their aspirations? Some are just to get it, just to get into college. Some is to get their first job. Some is to transfer to another school. Some is to, you know, allow for them to have a job and go to school so that they can provide. So we have to design systems and educational ecosystems that do that. Now, I believe that there are different type of institutions that serve different people. And not every institution should look the same. Your culture shouldn't be the same. Your academics should not be the same. The reason that we, there's a issue on cost is that everyone does the same thing. We just put a different brand in a different location and say, oh, we're university of this, but there's a criminal justice degree major everywhere. The reality is, do we need a criminal justice major from every department? And I'm a criminal justice major. That's why I, I, I kind of say I, I use that as it. But, but I, what, what I'm getting at is we need to start to 
every school doesn't have to be everything. It has to be who you're serving. How do you serve them in a much more effective way? And that starts with design thinking. And we run mm -hmm. design thinking sessions and we go into the, where's friction for that, that student? When I say friction is that student gets lost in the admissions process. That student gets lost in the financial aid process. That student gets lost in the career service part. Like where is the friction that your campus is putting in front and how do you solve for that? And that mm -hmm. could be solved differently for the different type of constituents that you have uh, as you move forward. Yeah, I think technology opens a lot of doors for campuses to be, to look different to every student. Yeah. I think that's one thing we sometimes miss is that we can customize the, the front end of the school around the needs of the student to a much greater degree than it used to be the case because we can plug in pieces of technology to provide a sense of community for students who have trouble getting to campus, to provide uh, you know, that entry into all sorts of uh, cultural or se sessions like this, like the forum, you know, to have conversations with people who are experts in the field and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, that's, it's, it's, it's a tricky mix. I think a lot of colleges kind of miss that because they're still thinking in the, in the, in the 20th century in terms of what they can do. Yeah. You know, you know, Tom, the one thing I would say is um, you have to get everyone aligned to a, to at least an idea of what, mm -hmm. where they're, we're all going. I do a session that talks about modernization. What does modernization mean? Right. It's such a hefty, hefty word. Right. Modernization means different things for different people. So mm -hmm. I actually go and say, OK, what does Amazon? What does it feel like to be modern in Amazon world? What does it feel like to be modern in Uber world? What does it feel like to be modern in Starbucks? And the reason I do this is that I want them to understand you. You appreciate all these modern things in the way that they engage, the way that they serve you, the way that they approach, you know, how you, who you are as a customer, a consumer, you know, all those things are really important. And because I all of a sudden let them define what modernization feels like that feels good for them, I say, mm -hmm. can you do that on a campus? How do we make it fast? How do we make it quick? How do we make it personalized? And Tom, you hit it on. There's so much technology that we can use. We are, we are operating at 400 times a blink of an eye technology. And what I mean by that, if you blink your eye, data processes at 400 times a blink of an eye, right? If you just look at your iPhone and it looks at them, that's how fast data is processing. The reason that we can do things so much more effectively if you adopt technology is because we're operating now. Now, the problem that we have in most universities is that when they have an issue, they go and ask for a technology to solve it without actually stopping and saying, what are we trying to do? Who are we mm -hmm. serving? What does modern look like? And then can we adopt the technologies that are out there already at a fraction of the price because they're already there and it's already built? How do you adopt it to the use cases that you're mm -hmm. trying to serve in your campuses? You go to the solution before you define the problem. That's a big exactly. problem. I have to, I fight my own students about that. I do that in my classes. And it's, it's so hard to get people to do that. Oh, yeah, I've got an answer. Anyway, well, that's, that's thank you, Brian. Oh, thank you, Tom. Always good to see you. <laughs> and everybody thank else, uh, that's an example of a video question. Um, now I'll give you another example as we have Regina Uribe. Uh, oh my gosh, I hope I haven't completely destroyed her name. Uh, from Guild Education, uh, she has a different question. Hello. Hi, uh, thanks for having me up on the stage. So um, I love the talk about interdisciplinarity that was referenced um, and, and thinking about how do we tie together, you know, high school with kind of college. And as we're thinking about transfers, you know, from community college to four-year schools, there's a lot of talk about collaboration and interdisciplinarity and even within institutions, but we rarely talk about what are the systemic um, barriers that are preventing such interdisciplinarity and systemic collaboration to occur. Um, so we'd love to kind of have a discussion around that because I think a lot of them exist, even, even as we think about, you know, academia and, and, and the desire to maintain tradition or rankings and how they pit us against each other um, are kind of a few examples that that kind of come to mind. 
you know, we just, if you just think about those things, we just have to look at the admissions process, right? It's not systematic. Um, we use grades that aren't uh, normalized in any way. You know, an A in one institution is not an A in another institution. We have standardized tests where, you know, I could I can hire, you know, tutors to get my daughter or my son in a better grade where there's others that can't do that. Um, so there's these systemic wrongs that are just inherent in what we do because, you know, sometimes it's, it's cool to say I go to a certain school or, hey, I go to a school that's ranked a certain way. Like we, we're almost living off of, you know, the stature as opposed to the value of that education, preparing these students for the life that they're going to live, right? Um, I was probably one of those students that were not prepared to be in uh, college at the time, right? But I had people that drove me to, be, to learn how to become prepared. I had good mentors out of college that prepared me to do it. I believe that it takes a village and it takes a community. And I believe it takes all institutions. For me, I'm not a believer that you have to get a degree from one institution. I believe that, you know, um, the asset that, that institutions um, have is the knowledge that they disseminate. And that knowledge is disseminated by faculty that are within those campuses. But we, we restrict them to be able to go to other to be able to get to a faculty member that might teach econ a certain way or that allows for a better uh, experience in a classroom because not everyone learns the same way. Not everyone's teaching style is the same. So when we say you have to get a, a degree from one place, I believe you're already systemically kind of boxing people into a lot of things. Now, there's, your question opens a lot, right? I, there's a lot of things that we could probably hold do a whole room on it either on Clubhouse or another forum. Um, I believe that we all have to recognize that what the system we're in is not fair to everybody. And it has to be the first thing we have to recognize is that while we like our titles, you know, everyone loves titles. titles. What was that, Brian? Hang on one second. Regina, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay. I think we might have lost Brian. Yeah. Sorry about that. Just had an audio glitch on my end. Just quickly reload the page. Uh, okay. Matt, that was a fantastically rich answer, and, and the, the chat box is blown up with all kinds of responses. Regina, thank you so much for that great question. Thank Regina, you. Regina, I'm happy to, to have a, a separate sidebar conversation because I do believe that it has to be across the board. It has to be lifelong learning. It has to start early. It has to end late. I think uh, with Future of Work, we need to make sure that we are building an ecosystem that is constantly teaching people what to do at the way that they need to learn, at the time they need to learn, too. So. Yeah, I, I would, I guess, uh, push us all to not, you know, I think the fad of design thinking is great, but this is then a plug for systems thinking. And we often don't spend the time to really think about the systems and and the inequities. And uh, I think combining the tools would be really powerful. Thank you. Thank you, that's a great idea. Uh, friends, if you're, if you're new to the forum, this is the kind of questions that people ask. Um, and there's still room for a lot more, and you can tell that Matt is happy to, uh, to engage. So again, just uh, uh, click the Q&A box. Um, and in fact, uh, as I mentioned this, a few questions have come in. Uh, one came in um, on the chat. I just want to share this quickly, Matt, uh, give you a sense of what you think about this. Uh, Joe, uh, let me see if I get his name right, Salueto asks, there's a massive move to capture market share, i.e., UMass acquiring Brandman, University of Arkansas acquiring Grantham, University of Arizona acquiring Ashford, the race for the adult student market. I'm just wondering if, if, if you can riff on that a little bit. Um, what do you think about that move? Yeah. So eventually where universities are going to move towards um, is an educational marketplace, right, that allows for uh, the, the border, the walls of that we have had on around campuses to be brought down and that's what you're seeing you're seeing what anytime you hear a global campus or you know you know mm -hmm. university of online and and things coming in um 
you are starting to see the first iterations of an educational marketplace where online learning is going to be decentralized in a lot of ways. Now, I'm a believer that you need you need to have in-person interaction. There is value to be on in, inside of a classroom or be inside of a setting that allows you to interact. So I don't I don't think it's going to be that everything is going to become online, but I do believe that uh, universities will look and feel a little bit more like continuing ed ecosystems where mm -hmm. it won't be a 16 week course. It could be a pop up on certain topics. It could be certifications on demand. It could be that a 16 week course is now broken up into parts that you remove the time element of it and you put the learning element of it. And that's how students are going to get into uh, their pathway into their careers and so forth. You know, there's no reason why we need 120 hours. And I'm not trying to bash anyone for 120. I, I have a 120 hour degree. What I'm saying is we, when we require a 120 hour degree, we are, we're making it a very expensive, uh, you know, investment to get into the market. And I'm a believer that how do we get people into the market sooner? So maybe it is, allowing you to work your way to a 120 hour degree or work your way into a master's or work yourself into the right programs. Um, and I believe this educational marketplace will allow for decentralization. So you will start to see blockchain. You will see a lifelong learning model. You will see a fit for purpose. And that uh, that is where we look at the future of work because work is going to be changing. Who does that work? Where is that work done? What technology is there? The 400 times a blink of an eye technology is going to be 800 times a blink of an eye. It's going to be a lot different as we move forward. And it's and you have to have the transformational discussion before you have any technology discussion. But I believe the one that I think is going to differentiate us here and, and these and these uh, institutions that are absorbing these online is the culture of service. How do we become a culture of service? How do we serve that personalized need of that student through the journey uh, in that in their lifetime of learning as they move forward. And that service is going to be convenient. It's going to be on demand and it's going to be able to do it to whatever they need at the time they need it as they move forward. OK, I was, I was going to ask how this would be new. And then you answered my question before I could say it, uh, which is great. Uh, we have a, a, a Q and A question. Uh, is coming from uh, Hilda Van Dyke, and we put this up on the screen. She asks, "What is your idea of peer learning and the teacher as a coach, and how scalable is this?" So I, you know, I'm all for. I, I believe teachers have to be teachers to other teachers. I think there is value to that. Um, so when you say teachers as a coach, I, are you asking it, the, that the learner, they are coaching the learner? Or are you talking about teachers coaching other teachers? I'm not sure on their question. I, I think, and Hilda, please correct me if I'm wrong, that she's referring to students teaching each other. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, I, I believe that, um, you know, there's five learning languages and the fifth one is about spoken you learn from from speaking with each other. So I believe when um, you learn as much when you're teaching someone mm -hmm. how to do something, you learn yourself because you start to understand it. You sometimes are challenged to do that. So I'm a big believer that um, learning has to come in different modals, and I believe uh, you know uh, peer learning is is as important. This is where um, I think having even a diverse ecosystem. Uh, within a campus, which could be um, provided by a more online learning ecosystem, because you may get someone who isn't from your social uh, uh, economical class. It may be someone with a diverse uh, uh, background. It could be someone that has a different religious background. You learn so much from that. Now, I went to a big state school here in Chicago. We were very diverse, and I there was diversity in so many ways, language, uh, ethnicity, color, uh, all that was as a play. And I believe that's how I really understood how to work with people when I went into the market 
And when I went into the ecosystem is that I had exposure to it and I got, and I learn all the time. I learn from my colleagues that I work with every day. So I believe peer learning is, is, is an important piece. Um, but I think you have to design it in a way that, um, competency is being me measured there, uh, as opposed to, did you meet with somebody there? I think it's a little bit of what did you learn from each other as you move forward? So the competency is really key. Hilda, that, thank you very much. That's a really good question. And Matt, thank you for the expensive answer. Uh, again, if you're new to the forum or new to the Shindig platform, that's an example of a, of a text question. Uh, I'm saying this and people are throwing in more, so I'm, I'm, I'm behind the curve. Let me bring up another video question. We've got to Richard Schultz, who founded Golden, and let's bring him up to ask his good question. Hello, Richard. Hello, thank you very much, Brian. Um, first of all, thank you for having this forum. I really appreciate the fact that you get everyone together communicating and thank you, Alex, for the work that you do as well. As well. Um, my question is uh, the, the higher education model that we have today is not sustainable. I think we could all agree that paying huge tuition and uh, going by curricula that is not really serving our workforce, teaching our learners things that are theoretical as opposed to really applicable to some of the things that they'll be doing in the workforce, that's not really a sustainable model. Uh, the work that I'm doing with a very small little startup group is called the Global Online Learning Extended Network or the Development and Extended Network or GOLDEN. And I can put up some information in the chat box if you're interested. But we have a group and Brian, you, your discussions here would fit perfectly into what we're talking about. We're talking about a model with higher education where there really isn't a traditional seat time, where there aren't credit hours, where there aren't degrees per se, but a completely disruptive model whereby there is a subject matter expert for the content, where there is a facilitator or a mentor, mentor that has the educational background to provide for the skills and the competencies that our learners must be able to demonstrate, plus an added component of someone from that particular discipline in the workforce that they're interested in, so that the student would have all of this nurturing from these different key players as part of this, design what they would like in terms of the skills and the competencies on their own, display those and show those in terms of a portfolio, and then be able to interface with that person from the workforce. So we're not talking about anything here having to do with grades and seat time. The, the emphasis can be on the student, on the learning, on the competencies, the skill sets that they need to be able to matriculate and effectively work into that uh, disciplinary workforce that they're interested in. It benefits both sides. So that's just a model that we're kicking around, but I'd like to hear from some others, uh, some feedback on that, and also anybody who would like to be involved in that discussion as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. So there was a, there was a lot there, right? Um, yeah. So I'm I'm going to push back a little bit because the workforce and serving the workforce is one one goal, one purpose. Um, it, it serves industry and it serves students, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I think what we want to understand is um, how does that become a part and complement a collegiate ecosystem that is really valued by the market. Right now, if I go to an HR person, they don't necessarily say that they want a particular skill or particular, they want right now a four-year degree. And so the question that we have to ask is, is industry ready to unhook the degree requirement that sits out there? The only way you're gonna get higher ed to change is if there's external factors that make it change. Because internally, they sit around the same room, the, the folks that look the same, that wear the same blue suits, that are that they have the gray hair, that sit around the thing, they're having the same discussion about what they believe 
market needs and industry needs. So, so what we need to recognize is they're not going to change unless industry mm -hmm. says your degree as it is today is not necessary. I need a unbundled type of credentialing system, maybe on blockchain, maybe with future work alignment. Like, so all these things you're talking about, I, I know really well because I, I talk about it all the time. The question is, is that what market needs? And is HR departments and industries willing to unplug that degree system? Because if they're not, then we have to design, Richard, we have to design higher ed to make that degree system somewhat more effective, affordable as you move forward. Because I don't think we're going to unbundle it if people aren't going to go recognize it. They're not going to re recognize a blockchain credential as something to get someone hired after you know six months of, of time or seat time or whatever it is. I think this has to be a collective discussion with many people, and I believe it, it's going to be driven that way. And I'm yeah, and yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Finish. And, and I don't think it's a one size fit all. Like right now, we have a one size fit all. Everyone has to go to college. Everyone has to sit in a lecture. Everyone has to to write notes. I, I like there's professors that'll say, "Oh, I need them to write notes. They can't take a picture. They can't like." The reality of it is, everyone learns differently, right? Yet we want everyone to learn a certain way and we learn differently. We, I work differently, right? So I think what we need to recognize is that we do need it personalized, but we also need to understand that we have to bring all of it together because there is good parts of, of what today's campuses do in challenging people, um, making, giving them a little bit of academic rigor that is beyond just learning a skill. Like I said to you, I'm a criminal justice major. If I just went with the skill that was taught to me in my classroom, I would be working in the juvenile system as a police officer. I designed some of the most complex student systems all over the country. Why? Because I got exposed to being able to think through, you know, um, documents, write papers, uh, make people um, formulate to my opinions, right? There's all these things that we don't necessarily actually put on a resume. We don't put that on a transcript. We look at a transcript and we get a chronological order of an A, B in a course. It doesn't, you look at my transcript and you're like, what does this guy really know about changing and transforming marketplaces? We don't, we have never changed that. Those are the things we're going to have to change. And I believe that it's not one um, element. I don't think it's a one size fit all. My daughter needed experience. Hence, she goes to Baylor, has a great experience there. She's learning and she's rigor and she needs that. She doesn't need a skill based uh, learning ecosystem. Now, mm -hmm. others may. Let's formulate that for them as they move forward. Yeah, I'm not saying it's a one size fits all. Don't get me wrong. And what you're saying really resonates with me. Um, it's just that employers, at least that I see, are really asking for, gee, I want somebody with these particular characteristics. And they're not really all that interested in having a degree in this because they're interested in what the people can do. And they're interested in how they're going to be able to hit the ground running in the workforce, as opposed to having to take six months to train them to actually do something. So. You're, all of your what you're saying here, Matt, is really resonating with me. Uh, That's great. All yeah, no, these and things. I, and I, think, I think the current curriculum has critical thinking, critical reasoning, interaction. Right. Like we don't put that anywhere. We don't put that on a resume, right. other than that, that that we say, hey, we do this. We don't put that on a transcript. We don't. Most universities don't showcase right. it. They showcase right. their U.S. News reports rankings. Like right. it's missing right. the things that what is really students are products and a product who can be, who can work in an ecosystem, who can have critical thinking, critical reasoning, can have EQ, body language. Those are really important skills that no one actually quantifies at a university or college, yet you get it. And that's what I think we should start showcasing as, as we look through the- Yeah, you know. and, and the question I would have is, how can we have those students working with those type of applications and not necessarily skills, but the idea of the knowledge behind that, how can they demonstrate that? 
how can they be able to show that to potential employers? Because years ago in higher education, it was not about getting a job per se. And now it's the pendulum has swung in that direction where students are looking in higher education to finish their degree so that they can become employed in the workforce. Well, Very different from years ago. And, yeah. and one, one reason for that is, of course, the escalating prices of higher education. Absolutely. I mean, and we can overstate that much as we can overstate the problem student debt, but the student debt amount is enormous. Uh, I mean, it's, it's clear that higher education is for many people a deeply financial transaction, like sure. buying a house. Um, but I, Richard, this, thank you so much for introducing Golden, yeah. and thank you for this great, great questions. We've got more questions coming. I'll make sure everyone's there, but I wanted to thank you, Richard. And, thank you. And Matt, you're clearly on fire here. So I, I want to throw some more, uh, some more kindling at you just to set the blaze up even higher. Uh, this is a question from uh, Vistas Gabari, who uh, has a question about credentials, a very precise one. Uh, as we move to stackable credentials and greater online modalities, what would it take for an institution of higher education to become a recognized aggregator and validator, allowing knowledge to be obtained at different and interact higher education institutions? I, I know Vistap well. He's a, he's in my clubhouses. So, uh, how you doing, President Vistap? Um, you know, micro credentials, stackable credentials, and how does how do we kind of curate this? Uh, this this goes back to my decentralizing uh, educational marketplace. It's a uh, I think we have to work with right now. We have accreditors who 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 basically dictate what courses and what what majors and what all these things that we're, I think we need to have a, a body that allows for micro credentialing to be uh, recognized early, uh, put, put reputation behind it. Meaning, you know, when someone is given a credential, what are, what are their outputs into market? I think we have to come to a, what I call a reputation economy where it isn't just that someone has been given a degree, but when that person is in market, how are they known and what, where do they go to school? What are the type of credentials that they got uh, in that? So I wanna make sure I understand his, his um, yeah. question. Can you put the question back up? Cause I, I can't, I think he's hang on one second. Backable. And I don't know what, he's, a, he's usually camera ready. I'm surprised he didn't wanna step up. Well, he just came back up. So let me, let me, let me put the, let me uh, first put the question back up and uh, and if you're camera ready, well, I see that smiling, bitter face. I'm going to bring him on stage. I'm just, I'm, I'm just predisposed to respecting bearded men. Hello, Professor Kabari. Hi, how are you? Very so good. So let me be a little more precise. It's a little beyond uh, micro-credentials and how we bring them together. It is how do we get a university to accept that knowledge gained at a variety of different universities can be brought together to give you whatever credential you wanted whether it was a degree or a micro-credential. The challenge here is not just the recognition of the micro-credential, but the recognition that I might take three classes at uh, University One and four classes at University Two and five classes at University Three and then go to University Four right. and say, I want to get a degree from there with only two more classes. If you truly wanted to go online and you truly wanted to have access, which was equitable, then within capacity of online modalities, we should be able to go from one to another. Yeah. So it's, it's more uh, sort of a thought challenge than anything else. Beyond the accreditation, what else would it take? Well, well, I think some of this is people have to value other people's work too, <laughs> right? So everyone thinks that if you go to this school, you're gonna be educated way better than another school. And the reality of it is you may be, but not every professor at every prestigious school teaches as well. And at, at some community colleges or some state colleges, you will have some phenomenal educators. This goes back to my reputation economy kind of discussion. Um, I do believe that, you know, these, these schools that are becoming mega, you know, in, in their ecosystem, I think if they start launching together, Western, uh, Western governors to UMGC to... Uh, Southern New Hampshire, Maryville, you you name it. And then, of course, Arizona, all these people that are, are now assuming this role of, I think if they come together and say, hey, 
among us. And you add, and I would say add the community colleges into the mix mm -hmm. because there's really affordable courses. Why are they not in the mix? I think if you bring all of them in the mix and they start to have a body that recognizes which courses are equal, which courses can be transferred seamlessly, and then where that degree is given from, maybe it is from an accrediting part of that body. Because right now, we have accreditors of an institution, and that institution dictates what a degree is. And I believe it should be by a broader group. Like right now, we have people who teach saying you have qualifications. The reality is, are they really qualified? So maybe it's an external body that looks at that. And I think Mm -hmm. you, have, you have thinkers, you have thinkers in this market, like the, some of the mega schools that could easily have a lot of cachet. Now you bring Guild into the mix of this, you bring others into the mix of this. And I think you build a, an ecosystem that is somewhat um, valued in that ecosystem. And then you bring industry into that. And I think that's how you drive the value towards that. Can, can I just quickly uh, hoist a comment from the chat that dives right into this? Uh, Rob McLeod says, Dr. Kabari, we do this mix and match all the time at our University of Utah BME program. Uh, I'm not sure BME stands for here. Um, we have automatic recognition of some courses and we manually evaluate any proposal a student brings to us for credit. Yours does not work this? That was the question. Yeah. So you're absolutely correct. I mean, some universities do it, but they do it to a limited extent. I'm looking for it more on a very widespread extent so that a student is not restricted geographically or by admissions to a certain set of universities. They can go and get that qualification they need in a very specialized area somewhere else and then come back and get a degree. I know some universities do it, but by and large, yeah. we don't allow it across the board. Uh, I, I, I think the statement that should be made here, and this could be where people in LinkedIn things I, I, I kind of put the whip on. I'm not sure if... if um, if universities and colleges should be in the business of granting a degree, they should be in the business of disseminating knowledge that a degree can be gained from a variety of the knowledge, right? Because right now, because of the admissions process, because of the way that the admissions process is systematically, you know, you know, restricts people into the ecosystem, you sometimes will have people that will never get into a, a BYU or other institutions because they just don't have the standards or the or built in that way. Now, the way that uh, the president is talking is, how do you open it up, let people learn, gain, earn, and all of a sudden they're in market because they've now learned and they've gotten through that path as you move uh, through the process. Well, th there might be a, a public role for this. Uh, in the check, Catherine Weinberg uh, says the state of Alabama is creating a master's degree in interdisciplinary studies that can stack approved certificates from other institutions into a, quote, vessel degree from the home institution. More flexibility for students. Catherine, I'd love to hear more about that. Uh, what, what do you think? Is that a, an example of this kind of thing maybe happening at the state level? Yeah, I, I think that we it isn't a revolution. This is going to be evolution, right? So we have to get people to be comfortable with a little bit of the next step and the next step and the next step. And then all of a sudden, we're not, we're not asking for a big change. We're asking for these little incremental changes. Higher ed is, it has a hard time changing, let alone big changes and saying, hey, go and accept everything. I think this is this incremental mindset that has to be there. I also think you have to bring outsiders into the mix of this. Mm. Um, and I think that's when you start to see the, the discussions change because sometimes you have to be in uncomfortable conversations to make that transformation. And that's what I, I think we should always be pushing. And then the reality of it is there's times like I challenge something and people push back and they're right. And you know what? That's okay. Cause then I just learned that what I'm thinking is not true or not as, as well um well thought out right and i think that's what people sometimes are afraid of it's like religion people don't want to hear other people's religion because they're afraid that their religion may not stack up and, and and i'm coming from a very religious family and i always used to say to my parents 
you have to learn someone else's religion before you actually recognize is your religion the right religion and i think this is the same thing in education like sometimes yeah. you may want to look at other models to say am i doing the right model that's a great metaphor um uh, it helps explain some of the passions here uh speaking of passions we've got time for one more question uh Vistops, thank you so much for that great question Vistop, good seeing you good to see you uh, and let me bring this up. This is from uh, the excellent uh, Sarah San Gregorio, uh, who is a PhD student. We should all be learning from her soon, I hope. And she asks, what would you say to those people who see college as social capital or a social experience that just happens to give you a credential? Is there a place for that? I, I believe there is both. Um, and like I said to you, I, I'm, I believe that different people will pick different... Um, they, have, they will have driven, they will have different drivers. And I believe social capital is, is a, a piece of that. Um, I think everyone has their own, you know, value drivers. You know, either your the, the five value drivers is brand. You know, someone resonates with brand. There's people that have experience and want social. Um, some people want to be specialized. Yeah. And then the other two are convenience and affordability. I think we have to kind of, allow for people to um, consume based on what they need. This goes back to my first comment. We have to define the purpose that we're really asking of that institution and that institution, can they serve that purpose uh, as, you, as you think through that? Well, that's a, first of all, Sarah, that's a great, great probe of a question. And Matt, I really appreciate that thoughtful answer. And I'm going to reward all this work in the worst possible way by saying we have to stop. Uh, we've just had a whole series of great questions and the chat has just been a, a seminar by itself. And Matt, you've just been a, a guru to us all. L let me quickly ask, what's the best way for us to keep up with you um, as you hurdle forward in this great work? Yeah, so the best way to keep up with me is probably just on LinkedIn. I am, as Brian alluded to, um, <laughs> I'm cringeworthy on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't. I don't usually hold back. You're great. Um, and and I think it's just it's necessary. Like if I if I hold back, um, I don't think people actually. There's too much spin the other way. Mm -hmm. Like everything is is working great, and the reality of it is, let's just have let's have really good conversation. So Juan, Brian, I want to say thank you for letting me be cringeworthy here uh, for for the hour. Uh, I am very accessible. You can find me at beyondacademics.com. You can find my writing. Um, but I think if you want to just get a hold of me, you can email me at mattalex at beyondacademics.com or just ping me on LinkedIn. I, I connect with people. Uh, you will also find me on Clubhouse. I run a, a clubhouse called Future X Tribe, and I see a lot of my, uh, my friends who are there uh, here. Um, and we're, we're doing a bunch of what we call think spaces, and you will see Think spaces are things like this, but we're going to be very engaged. So you'll see that as you move forward, working with some of the most innovative organizations doing think spaces for their uh, organization, as well as the campuses that I serve. So um, thanks so much for uh, having me, and I enjoyed the conversation. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, it really is. Um, and uh, I really look forward to following up and seeing uh, what else you get to do with this. Um, everyone, make sure that you get a chance to spend time uh, with Matt uh, online. But before I close up, let me just point out to where things are headed over the next uh, few weeks. Remember, we have a whole series of topics coming up, uh, everything from enrollment to the climate crisis to eco-media to libraries. If you want to sign up for more, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about all these issues from credentials to the meaning of higher education to stackability to the role of the government to what learning is we use the hashtag ftte uh, on twitter you can always tweet at me brian alexander or at shindig events you can always find me talking about this kind of stuff on my blog brianalexander.org uh, if you'd like to dive into the past and look at our previous sessions considering some of these topics just head to tinyurl.com FTF archive and be sure to subscribe. Now, thank you again for all these fantastic, fantastic questions and comments. Uh, this has been a very heady, very exciting, very thoughtful and inspiring hour. Thank you all for that. In the meantime, continue your great work in this fall semester. 
Um, I look forward to hearing from everybody about your stories, about your involvement in higher education. Above all, stay safe and take care. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.